All right. So, so far we've been covering a lot of combination logic circuits, things like logic gates, lookup tables, more advanced uh, logic circuits like adder subtractors, things of that sort. But I want to take a brief moment to cover the concept of abstractions. Now, this should be something that you should already be familiar with, even if it's on a subconscious level. But I want to bring it to your attention so that you're aware of it on a conscious level. The reason why is if you understand what abstractions are and how they can be used, they can be very, very useful when it comes to designing circuits and very handy when it comes to troubleshooting circuits. So for those reasons, I would say it's a good concept to cover. Now, what exactly is an abstraction? In short, and in my words, an abstraction is nothing more than the act of representing behavior, but not implementation. What exactly do I mean by that? Well, let's take a look at logic gates again for just a brief moment. When we looked at logic gates, we first looked at how they behaved. We understood that they take in two binary integers, and they perform some form of logical operation with them, typically AND or OR, and in the case of unary operations, typically NOT. We then tie these behaviors to a visual representation, these schematic symbols, if you will. This behavior and these schematic symbols are an abstraction of logic gates. They are a simple way of representing the behavior of what the logic gate actually does. The implementation, however, is the fine details that we typically gloss over when we're simply talking about the abstraction. Later on, we filled in those details with the use of redstone. We covered the idea of the implementation of logic gates by looking at how we can build them using redstone torches, redstone repeaters, and redstone wires. Now, I could go into the idea that redstone in and of itself is an abstraction of something else, but let's not get that deep. Not yet, anyway. The point is, you understood what a logic gate was and what it did before we even entered the idea of the implementation. What's more, if you were in an electronics course, the implementation would be something different entirely. We would actually be looking at transistors and wires and induction and currents and all those sorts of things. But the concept, the abstraction of logic gates, remained the same. So why then does it matter that we only look at behavior and not implementation? Why can't we concern ourselves with implementation? The reason the reason why is implementation is detail, and we as human beings are not very good at dealing with large amounts of detail. The further out we zoom, the less detail we can actually comprehend. By simply looking at the behavior, we're forced to take complex implementation and boil it down into simple, typically single sentence descriptions. This allows us to wrap our heads around much larger and much more complicated ideas. In fact, I'll show you just how much of a difference a good abstraction makes. Here we have a really, really confusing and convoluted circuit. I challenge you here to just pause the video for maybe a minute or two and try and figure out what the circuit does. It's pretty complicated, isn't it? There's a lot of logic gates, there's a lot of wires, there's a lot of things going every which direction. It's very, very difficult to track. You can do it but it's going to take you time. Now, what if I switch out this circuit view for this one? This is the same circuit as what I just showed you before. The circuit prior was the implementation of what this circuit is. And this circuit is the abstraction. You can see very, very quickly and very, very clearly that this circuit is an adder. You don't even have to think. It took you less than a second. You figured it out instantaneously what this circuit is and what it does. Now, abstractions also have another use besides just allowing you to quickly understand the behavior of a circuit. Because it wraps up complex implementation in a shell of simple behavior, it allows us to manipulate it and use it in other circuits much more effectively. Much like how we can take and, or, and not gate and combine them together and pull out the abstraction of an exclusive OR gate. And then we can take the exclusive OR gate, the behavior of which is known, but the implementation we don't really care about, and we can manipulate that with AND gates and another OR gate to create a half adder. And then we can extract that abstraction, we can put two of those together with a couple more logic gates, and we have a full adder. We can then abstract that, layer them across several bits, and create a multi-bit adder. Each time we go up a layer, the layer below gets abstracted itself. This allows us to create circuits that implement very, very complex behavior without diving too deep into the details of the implementation. This also means that no matter where we look in the layers of abstraction, if we want to understand what's happening in that layer of abstraction, we never have to look at more than three or four complex ideas, all of which themselves are, of course, abstracted. This ability to abstract out complex implementation with simple behavior and manipulate it in another context allows us to create more complex, more complicated circuits circuits. For example, here I've designed a black box that I've labeled quadratic. It's nothing more than a circuit that takes in three arguments and produces two answers in accordance to the quadratic equation. The implementation is kind of complicated, but the idea of the behavior itself is simple to grasp. You give it a couple arguments, it does something with them, and then it produces two answers. Now if we look at the implementation, 
the implementation itself is nothing more than a handful of abstracted circuits. You can very clearly see that A and C get multiplied together in this multiplier circuit. That gets multiplied with 4, and then that gets subtracted from the B input, which is first squared. Then that gets thrown into a square root circuit. That gets thrown into this circuit here, which takes in a number and then splits it into a positive and negative equivalent. And then both those get sent to these circuits, which adds them to negative B, and then divides it with the product of 2A. Don't get it confused. This is is implementation, but it's implementation using bits and pieces of abstracted circuits. And the reason why is if we were to use the pure redstone or metal implementation, this circuit would be as complicated, if not more complicated, than the implementation of the adder that we looked at earlier. So it is complicated, but it's still easy to wrap your head around what's going on, even if you don't fully understand some of these circuits and how they implement what it is they do. For example, we've never actually gone over multiplication, division, square root, roots or power circuits at all. But it doesn't matter because the behavior is defined well enough that you understand what's going on. Just for kicks, let's also go down another layer of abstraction into this plus or minus circuit here. I really don't know if there's a good name for this, but we'll see what it does just by looking at the implementation. Here you can see that it takes an input, this plus minus argument, and it splits it down three paths. The first one goes straight into this D multiplexer. The second one passes through this two's complement circuit, which we all know what two's complementing does, just basically inverts the number to its positive or negative equivalent, depending on the sign, and then sends that into its own DMUX as well. And lastly, the third branch gets sent into a comparator, which seems to be comparing it with zero and checking to see if it's less than zero. Effectively, this is a flag that tells us if the input is negative. Now that flag passes into the switch input of the DMUX, or both DMUXs in this case, and we can see that if the input number is positive, the two numbers that are generated, the positive and negative number, well, they go to their respective OR gates on the end here. But if the input number is negative, that two's complement is going to generate a positive, so the two MUXs get enabled, and they switch the directions of the numbers. This is effectively make sure that if a negative number comes in, a negative number is going to go down to the bottom, and a positive to the top, and if a positive number comes in, a positive number is going to stay at the top, and a negative number is going to be generated for the bottom. All this circuit does is it takes in any number and returns both a positive and negative equivalent of it. Now again, there's abstractions in this layer too. The comparator is an abstraction of a complex idea, likewise with the two's complement circuit and the DMUX and one would argue even the OR gates. But we don't need to get into the implementation of those pieces in order to understand what's going on here. We just have to look at the layer and what it encompasses, and we just have to comprehend the handful of abstracted components that it uses and understand the relationships. Now, if your abstractions are designed well enough, they accomplish three things. The first is it allows you to design circuits that can implement complicated behaviors without needing to concern yourselves with the low-level details. Two is it allows somebody who's new to your circuit to be able to grasp the idea of what this circuit does quickly and easily. And the third thing kind of ties into the second, but if somebody can quickly understand what it is your circuit is supposed to do, it can also help them troubleshoot it, especially if they have to delve deep into the layers of abstraction in order to find the concrete piece of circuitry that is at fault. We'll talk more about circuit design and circuit troubleshooting in future videos, but the last piece of information I want to leave you with is this. All of that is contingent on designing good abstractions, and designing good abstractions is an art. It's something that takes practice. I don't really know if there's any tips or tricks on designing good abstractions. If I think of any, I'll be sure to make another video and upload it. I will say though, we will be revisiting the idea of abstraction when we start to look at circuit design and troubleshooting because both of those practices rely heavily on abstraction. Until then, I just say keep this idea kind of in the back of your head. Understand that everything that you're seeing is usually an abstraction, nothing more than a representation of the behavior, and the implementation is usually the complicated or complex bit. Understand that you don't need to know the implementation in order to know the behavior, and also understand that if you understand abstraction, it will allow you to wrap your head around larger ideas, and even allow you to construct some larger ideas of your own.